Um, <clears throat> very briefly, can I just, uh, on behalf of the Minister and on the part of Chagas, welcome you all, uh, Minister, Ambassadors, uh, and general stakeholders, participants, drivers, owners of the dairy sector in Ireland to uh, the Countdown to Quota Conference. It's a, a unique conference, four and a half months out from the end of quotas. Um, it's, uh, we're, the Minister of the Department in Chagas are very pleased to have it at this particular time. It's terribly opportune. A few housekeeping bits. You, you note the fire exits over there on the, on the left. Um, if you wouldn't mind turning your phones off or to silent. And I, from, I just want to let you know that the proceedings are being live streamed uh, via the department's website and the Chagas website. Um, the, the, you've seen the programme, so I won't even go through the programme, just to let you know that uh, you know, on, the, on the way it has been structured, it should, it looks like being a very useful, uh, uh, opportune, clearly, and uh, enjoyable and productive day. So with that, I just want to uh, call on the Minister for Agriculture, Mr. Simon Coveney, uh, TD, to, uh, to address you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, in particular, uh, can I thank all of our guests who have traveled to be here. Um, can, I, can I welcome the president of the IFA, uh, Eddie Downey, the president of the ICMSA, John Comer, the president of Mark and Affirma, Kieran O'Dowd, uh, Deputy Pat Deering, uh, and any other public representatives uh, who are here, uh, as well as uh, all of the key business leaders uh, in the dairy sector in Ireland and the companies you represent. Uh, and, of course, uh, the key policy decision makers and designers in the Department of Agriculture and in Chagas who are co-hosting this Countdown to Quota Abolition Conference. Uh, I want to uh, also, uh, in particular, welcome uh, the ambassadors that are here this morning, uh, including um, uh, uh, ambassadors from the United States, from Russia, from Mexico, from Saudi Arabia, and the United Ar Arab Emirates. Uh, and any others uh, who are here, uh, as well as consuls who are here. Uh, the, the Mexican ambassador met me this morning and said, uh, we want your milk, so when can you deliver it? Um, which I think kind of set the tone uh, for today. Uh, can I just say I've been talking about liquids all morning, uh, and I'm very pleased to be talking about milk for the next 40 minutes, uh, I can assure you. Um, there's a number of points I want to make to introduce because I think we have a standard of speaker here today uh, which is really exceptional uh, in terms of giving an insight into the key uh, different sessions that we're focusing on today from new market opportunities across the world, many of which are, are already being explored and developed, uh, to the management of price volatility which I think is the most important section of today for us to focus on. Uh, and then obviously, of course, talking about efficiencies and innovation actually on the farm uh, to ensure that this story is as positive as it has the potential to be for farm families and for rural Ireland over the next 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 years. Uh, because, as, because can I say, as Minister for Agriculture and Food, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important and exciting development for rural Ireland that we've seen in a generation. Uh, and that is some statement to make. Uh, I also think for the Irish economy, this is one of the most significant um, opportunities for the Irish economy that we have seen for many years in the most important indigenous industry for our economy. Uh, we have essentially been operating within a straitjacket uh, in the dairy industry in Ireland since 1984. Uh, we are now planning for, preparing for, and are going to deliver a growth in output uh, and a maintenance in the journey of premiumization in the dairy industry, which is going to deliver extraordinarily exciting results for farmers who prepare and manage the transition and the growth opportunity uh, in a way that is responsible and smart. Uh, and also for the processing sector and for the broader food sector, whether that's food ingredients, whether it's the nutrition sector, whether it's basic dairy processing, uh, uh, or any other linked service industries. Uh, the opportunities here that we are 
uh, planning for uh, in uh, four months' time, or starting in four and a half months' time, uh, in my view, uh, offer a really, really exciting journey and story for Irish agriculture. Uh, and just to put this into perspective for a second, what this means at farm level is that we are effectively moving from producing 5.5 billion litres of milk per year to over 8 billion litres of milk per year in the space of five years. What that means in, in jobs and numbers terms is essentially about 300,000 extra milking cows on family farms across the country. Uh, and at least an extra 3,000 um, young people, pr predominantly milking cows, uh, dairy farm managers uh, and dairy experts across the existing dairy farms and new dairy farms that will be created over that period. And that's just the first five years. And so the challenges of that alone, in terms of education, in terms of upskilling, in terms of preparation for that herd expansion and herd management, uh, is significant. On top of that, we will be looking at a, at, at, a, at a yield increase of somewhere between 15 and 20 percent across our herds as well. And again, the preparation for that in terms of research, in terms of things like feed conversion efficiency, more efficient use of genomics and breeding programs, more efficient uh, grazing um, management uh, on farms I I is significant. Uh, and so this has already been, uh, if you like, a three-year preparation process to build up now to, to getting the green light for that expansion. Uh, we still have to keep reins on output to minimize or, if possible, avoid a significant super levy fine uh, as a result of overproduction and the build-up to quota abolition. Uh, and, of course, most importantly, we need to ensure that at a farm level and at a processing level, there is a business plan uh, that, is, uh, that is in place to ensure that actually this isn't just about volume growth. It's about building a better business on the back of that volume growth. And the starting point has to be a sustainable, smart, efficiently run, innovative dairy business at farm level and at processing level. And if, if that's the starting point, well, then we can build on scale and volume after that. And so what we will be talking about this morning in session one is where is all this milk going to go? Where is all this product going to go? Because it's going to be infant formula. It's going to be casein. It's going to be whey product. It's going to be butters. It's going to be cheeses. Uh, it's going to be sports nutrition product. It's, it's going to be dairy ingredients uh, and a whole lot else besides. And we are moving all of, uh, as well as, of course, powders, uh, skimmed and semi-skimmed and whole milk powders. But all of those products are moving from essentially being basic uh, value commodity products uh, that are traded worldwide to being premium products in all of the markets that we are targeting. And the reality is that the majority of the new volume that we produce will not only have to find a home outside of Ireland, but we'll have to find a home predominantly outside of the European Union as well. Uh, and that is why it is so encouraging to have ambassadors here from really exciting markets uh, like the United States, uh, like Russia in the future, uh, like Mexico, like Saudi Arabia. Um, last week we were in China, uh, where last year uh, we sold uh, over 300 million euros worth of dairy products. And we will see a 25% growth on top of that again this year. Uh, and what's really interesting about that market is that most of the volume is going into really high-end premium brands. If you go into a, an infant store or a large retail outlet now in Beijing or Shanghai or Qingdao or um, any one of about 40 cities that all have populations of between 10 and 20 million people, you will see in the premium plus-plus category um, which is charging somewhere between 40 and 65 US dollars a tin uh, of, of infant formula versus 10 or 15 dollars equivalent for uh, homegrown uh, uh, produce. Uh, you will see Irish brands, not only Irish brands, but Irish brands with Irish flags on the tin. You know, brands like Aluma, 
brands like, brands like uh, um, uh, um, uh, Aliva, uh, brands like um, uh, Green Love, uh, which we were spreading when we were over there, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and more besides. I know we have Dan on here today, uh, who are also developing a, a similar premium plus, plus brand, which will be a major part of the Chinese story as well into the future. But that's just one segment of one market in one part of the world. Uh, and there is so much more opportunity for us uh, than, than that one market, but it is significant. Um, but when you consider that at the moment, in 2013, for example, Irish dairy exports to Nigeria were similar to the value of dairy exports to, to the United States, it gets you thinking. Ex exports to Senegal outperformed exports uh, to Ireland's more traditional near European trade partners. Uh, two years ago, we, we sold 40 million euros worth of cheese to Algeria. Um, and so these are the new markets that are growing, that are developing, that are exciting. Uh, and our companies, because of their scale, because of their know-how, and because of their international footprint, are investing and developing opportunities in these markets. And if you look at, for example, what the Irish Dairy Board has done in the United States in, in terms of spending very large sums of capital investment uh, on cheese manufacturing facilities uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, if you look at the partnerships they've developed in cities like Riyadh around soft white cheese, the partner partnerships they've developed in North Africa, uh, the new opportunities that they're looking to develop uh, in China uh, and in other parts of Asia for that matter, you begin to see the level of preparation and investment that many of us uh, have not focused in on. But it's all about preparing for post-quota realities in terms of the dairy industry in Ireland. And of course, if you look at our big companies, all of whom are represented here today, uh, from Glambia to Kerry, uh, uh, to Dairy Gold, uh, to Carberry, uh, to obviously Lakeland, uh, and so many others, um, uh, they are all also planning for increased output, managing markets to ensure that actually we can do that in a sustainable way from an income perspective and that we can do everything we reasonably can to hedge against and to insure against and to prepare for the price volatility which whether we like it or not is going to be a reality indefinitely into the future in dairy markets. And that brings me to the second session which is a real focus on price volatility. Uh, we are lucky in some ways that we have essentially seen two to three years now of very strong dairy prices. Um, and, and our dairy farmers have got a, um, uh, a deserved um, income kickback from that. And it's allowed many of them to invest in and prepare for uh, expansion plans that are now going to be implemented in the next 12 months. Uh, but we are also now, over the next six to eight months, likely to see the negative side of price volatility. The reality is that the that the fundamentals of the economics of dairy production in Ireland are very, very good. We are going to see steady and consistent growth in dairy consumption across the globe, certainly for the next 40 years, uh, with population growth, with increased income levels, with increased demand for protein, um, with increased numbers of women in the workforce in large parts of the developing world, and therefore demanding more infant formula, uh, and most importantly, uh, in my view, a growing demand for product that people can trust and stand over. Uh, and that is going to be Ireland's huge um, uh, premium opportunity uh, to deliver into these markets. But there will also be times, like we have at the moment, where we've seen two um, global harvests in a row that have been very successful, where we see cheap grain available on the markets, which is driving... Um, significant increases in, in dairy production uh, across almost all production markets uh, and where, where we've seen a slight weakening of demand, of the pace of demand growth in China, uh, where we've seen, um, uh, unfortunately, an embargo um, uh, in relation to uh, opportunities in the Russian market uh, for the moment, which hopefully will only be temporary, but is still a, a significant factor uh, uh, impacting dairy prices at the moment. And so we are likely to see um, a, a dairy price fall, perhaps quite a significant fall, in the next number of months. And we need to be prepared for that. Uh, we need to expect it if it's going to come. 
by understanding the markets and where they're going in the short to medium term, but also anticipating that that will be a temporary problem. Uh, and that is why it's so important that we have financiers here, that we have a banking system here um, um, that, that will need to work with some farmers over the next six to eight months, farmers that have invested heavily, planning for expansion, and will, uh, will deliver the benefits of that expansion over time, but may have short-term difficulties financially because of uh, the potential of um, a, a downside of price volatility over the next six to eight months. And that may or may not transpire, but we need to be planning for it and we need to be, to be ready for it. And if anything, that needs to reaffirm in our minds the need to do things in Ireland, as well as at a European level, which I'll talk about in a second, to actually try to insulate our primary producers of the raw material that we need to build this industry. And that means looking at uh, locking in medium-term pricing contracts for a portion of our milk. And I know some of the co-ops and some of the dairy companies have already encouraged farmers to do that. We need to do more of it. We need to look at other things like, like dairy futures markets uh, in Ireland and in Europe um, so, that, so again we can try to invest early to hedge against uh, the, uh, the dramatic highs and lows uh, of, of price volatility. But the last, in the last couple of years it's been very difficult to do that effectively because prices have been so strong. So it's been a little bit like asking somebody to, uh, you know, to, uh, to change a, um, um, you know, a, um, a, the mortgage that they're currently on to some kind of fixed rate higher mortgage uh, to, to hedge them against some kind of you know, future interest rates increases. Um, you, you know, uh, you know, to ask somebody to come off a tracker mortgage at the moment is almost impossible. Uh, and that has been the difficulty in the dairy industry for the last couple of years because, of, uh, uh, because prices have been so strong. So the, the lessons that we will learn over the next six to eight months, the anticipation of those lessons, uh, I think uh, require a collective response from processors, from farmers and farming organizations, from my department, from Chagask, um, uh, from the Oroctus Committee, and I see um, uh, Andrew Doyle, the, the chair of the Agricultural um, Oroctus Committee uh, has joined us, uh, and most importantly from banks and financial institutions that can actually help farmers get over uh, the kind of difficulties that we may see um, um, uh, over the next um, uh, six months or so. The kind, of, um, the kind of challenges, for example, that pig farmers face on a fairly regular basis uh, and manage with their financial institutions. So that session, uh, which will be the second session, managing price volatility in a post-quota world, I think is something that everybody should take hugely seriously because we have a real quality panel to discuss that, not only from Ireland but also internationally um, um, from, a, from an international banking system as well as from international dairy companies who are also facing this challenge. Um, we'll, then, we'll then finish up with session three, which will be very much focusing on efficiencies, innovation and the drive around profitability. Um, our three key words in the Food Harvest 2020 strategy are smart, green, growth. And that's what we need in dairy at every link in the chain. We need to make sure that farmers have the tools, the skill set, the education, the knowledge, and the data available to them through organizations like ICBF and Chagask, Chagask and our department to be able to run the most efficient production systems that they can on the back of a grass-based system, which is where we have a natural competitive advantage versus most of our competitors. Uh, and Jerry Boyle and, uh, and others will reinforce that message very, very strongly later on. We need to make sure that Ireland continues to build on the reputation for taking sustainability seriously. We're no longer now selling Ireland purely on the basis of imagery. Green fields, green grass, happy cows, family farms. That's all, that all provides a good feel-good factor around this industry. But on the back of, of that traditional image, if you like, we now have science and audits and data collection to back that up. And on every, all 16 or all 17,000 dairy farms in the country, we are going to roll out an audited, an audited dairy sustainability uh, program, which will be about incremental improvements year on year. 
about providing an audit which guarantees the protection of biodiversity on those farms, which manages the water usage, even though we have no shortage uh, at the moment, uh, on those farms, uh, which, which measures and manages things like feed conversion efficiency to deliver milk in the most efficient way we can on the back of a supplemented grass-based system, uh, which, which will audit grazing systems, again, um, promoting sustainability, which will measure the carbon footprint from those herds. Because uh, as, a, as a sector in the Irish economy, agriculture represents 40% of our emissions challenge outside of the, the traded sector. And we will have to meet targets in the future, whether we like it or not, by 2020 and again by 2030. Uh, and I can promise you this, that I will not allow a situation where the potential for growth and expansion of the agri-food industry will be compromised by the setting of emissions limits. But that does not mean that we don't have a significant responsibility to be the most efficient produ producer of dairy products and milk on the planet when it comes to sustainability, sustainability and internationally certified measurement and audit systems, which we are going to introduce, which also, by the way, have a direct link with financial efficiency uh, and profitability on the farm. Um, and of course, we need to deliver growth. Uh, and we are well placed to do that. There is no other country in the world talking about increasing their output by 50% in five years. Uh, in fact, I don't think there's any other country in Europe, even uh, in the mid-teens, in terms of their ambition for growth and expansion. Uh, and that is essentially because Ireland has not been uh, fulfilling its potential because of uh, supply control since the 1980s. Uh, and so now we are starting the exciting journey that New Zealand began when, when Ireland had uh, quotas imposed uh, for good reason at the time. But, but, but now that policy is both outdated uh, and is not connected with the realities of global food security any longer. Uh, and as you will, many of you will have heard me say many times before, Back in 1984, when, when, when Europe introduced supply controls, Ireland produced more or less the same volume of milk as New Zealand. Both of us produced about 5 billion litres. New Zealand was slightly above that, uh, of milk per year. New Zealand now produces just under 20 billion litres of milk per year. They've quadrupled output. Uh, what we are doing is, and they've done that essentially by increasing output by about 5% a year steadily, year on year. What Ireland is now planning to do over a five-year period, but continuing on after that, uh, is a similar journey. I'm not suggesting we'll be quadrupling output in the next uh, 30 years, but certainly we can double output. Uh, and it'll be the dairy farmers and the families in Ireland on dairy farms uh, working with agencies of the state, working with their financial institutions, working with their co-ops, um, um, uh, and working with um, my department and future ministers uh, to deliver a policy platform and a financial support system that can deliver on that potential. We can do this. We will do this. Uh, it is an extraordinarily exciting journey that we're about to begin. We have prepared for this, in my view, uh, uh, in the best way that, that we could have over the last three years. Uh, we have the added challenge now of ha having to deal with price volatility and the negatives of that potentially over the next six to eight months. But that's doable too. Uh, as long as we know what's coming, we can prepare for it. Uh, and as long as we have a medium to long-term outlook, um, uh, well, then we will get through short-term difficulties as we have in other sectors in recent years. Uh, so can I once again thank all of the speakers here today. Uh, can I in particular thank George Lee for being here uh, because I know there's a lot else going on today uh, in your brief, if you want to call it that, George, uh, um, uh, uh, involving a slightly clearer liquid than, than milk. Um, and um, so I appreciate your commitment to this conference. The significance of this conference, in my view, will be seen over time. Uh, and as we build up to April uh, of next year, the excitement uh, within agriculture, in my view, um, will, needs to be managed, but will be very, very evident. Uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to the start of that journey and to delivering on, on the potential of a sector that has so much to give to rural Ireland and, uh, and to farm families right across the country. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here.
Well, th thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. Um, uh, wonderfully enthusiastic and um, uplifting presentation and a great way to get us started. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is George Lee. I'm the Agriculture and Environment Correspondent at RTE, and I'm going to be the moderator for our first session this morning, which is a panel session. Uh, because there, as the Minister outlined, there are a huge amount of opportunities out there, but there is the question of realism for many people on the ground, and we've seen uh, whether there's a lack of transparency or a lack of communication or a lack of understanding that wires can get crossed in the beef industry or anywhere else and people get hurt. So it's very important for us to have a very real grasp in terms of what these wonderful opportunities are for the country that are there and what it means for us to go for it, for everybody in the supply chain. So an awful lot of stuff needs to be teased out and I'm really looking forward to that this morning. So we have a very, very interesting panel of really expert people with the fantastic insights into the whole agri-food industry and I'm looking forward to hearing from them. But first, we're going to kick off with a presentation about where we are um, kind of exactly Ireland right now in terms of our dairy industry, uh, where the potential is in terms of growth markets and what's being done in terms of um, branding and in terms of uh, potential out there. And nobody better to give us that insight other than Aidan Cotter, who's the Chief Executive of Board BIA, which is the Irish Dairy Board. Aidan, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, uh, Minister, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. It is already the single largest component of our food and drink exports, accounting for 37% of the total last year when we include fat-filled milk powder. But as the industry begins to realise the opportunities now about to open up, it is set to dominate total export revenues by the end of this decade, and it is well positioned to do so. It is well positioned because it has an international marketing footprint that is truly global. When we look at the distribution of exports last year, as much as 42% of the total were destined for the UK market. Just 32% of dairy exports went there. And while 26% of the total went to markets outside the European Union, almost 40% of all of our Irish dairy products were exported to markets outside the European Union. In fact, Irish dairy exports went to over 140 countries in 2013. And notwithstanding the static milk pool with which the industry has had to operate over the last three decades, nevertheless, we can see the perceptible pull of international markets represented by the red bars at the top, uh, by the red segments uh, uh, on, the, on the bars at the top of this chart. And indeed, moreover, when we look more closely at the distribution of our dairy exports to international markets, we find further evidence of the broad base of the industry's international market footprint, all based with an increasing focus on Asia and Africa and the Middle East, represented by the green, the grey and the red segments of those bars, and which collectively last year accounted for 80% of our total dairy exports to international markets. But the most striking pattern of all, of course, is the sustained growth in our dairy exports to China, which is now Ireland's second largest market for dairy, driven largely but not exclusively by the growth in infant formula, which accounted for over two-thirds of our total dairy exports to China last year. And with an emerging branded presence and the continued pursuit of new opportunities in the market, the role of China in terms of determining the future fortunes of the Irish dairy industry, both direct now as well as indirect through its international influence on global markets, the role of China cannot be overstated. So what's driving the growth in the global demand for food? Population is certainly a factor. 7.3 billion people today. It is rising at 75 million people every year. It will reach 8.1 8 billion people in 10 years' time in 2025, the time horizon we are taking today. And as the population is growing, it is also urbanizing, driven in particular by Asia, Africa and Asia, whose urban populations are still below 50%. 54% of people live in cities around the world at the moment. That will rise to 58% in 10 years' time, and 66% by 2050, when the world will hold 9.6 billion people. And it is that pace of urbanization that is linked with the growth in the middle classes, the people with buying power, with changing lifestyles, with change, shifting dietary patterns to have more protein-based foods and dairy products, that is really driving the growth in the global demand for food. 
According to an OECD working paper, 3 billion more consumers will join the middle classes in this and the next decade alone. And so taking the 10-year time horizon under consideration here today, that's 1.5 billion people joining the middle classes by 2025, creating a market in buying power terms three times the size of the European Union, a market evolving principally in the Asian region. Asia, Asia and Africa, the two regions of the world that already hold <coughs> over three out of every four people living in the world today. And with Africans, Africa's population growing particularly rapidly, it is set to house almost one in every five of the world's population just in 10 years' time. Indeed, over the next 10 years, as the global population expands by another three quarters of a billion people, as we can see from this chart, the majority of that growth is going to be in Asia and it's going to be in Africa. Part of the reason the population is growing and a major feature of demographic change in the developed markets today is that people are living longer all over the world. <coughs> the share of the world's population over in Europe, for example, by 2025 will be more than 200 million people. And as people get older, they want to feel better, they want to live longer, they want to uh, lead an active and healthy lifestyle. Health and wellness is unarguably the single biggest driver of change in food markets today. And those who can leverage it effectively through nutrition are those who will ultimately prevail in the global marketplace. The, Irish, the opportunity for the Irish dairy sector to position itself and to continue to position itself in the health and wellness segment of the market, particularly taking account of the growing recognition of the role of protein in the diet among young and old alike has hardly ever been greater. And as the pendulum continues to shift in its direction, and as dietary guidelines towards fat become more benign, the opportunity just continues to grow. The drivers of growth in the demand for food are relentless. But they are being met by supply challenges that didn't exist before. Instead, we are met with falling rates of growth in productivity, and climate change, unpredictable weather events linked to markets and price volatility on scales not previously experienced. We have a world facing water scarcity, and agriculture requires 70% of the use of it for irrigation. We have a fixed land supply and the competing use of, of it for fuel as well as for food. There are constraints that, as we shall see in a moment, are set already to have an impact on forecast production levels over the next 10 years. In the meantime, that surge in demand is finding expression in these 10-year rolling forecasts uh, in the global growth in the demand for food. These projections show the projected growth in demand for protein, represented here by livestock and fish products in the period of 2023. The red bars ri rising highest represent the projected growth in, in consumption for the developing countries, that is, the emerging markets. The lower green bars represent the more sedate growth uh, projected for the developed world, namely the OECD area. And blue bars represent the growth in the global demand for protein, namely the average between the two. What is also notable about this chart is how amongst the highest growth categories, the bars rising highest are the categories representing the dairy sector the butter, the cheese, the whole and skimmed powder. Those red bars for the developing countries for the dairy products are, <coughs> represent a growth in production, in, in, in production projected of upwards of 30 and upwards of 40% depending on the category. That translates into an average global consumption in developing and developed countries alike of an average annual growth predict, uh, predicted over the next 10 years of 2.4% per annum with that growth particularly concentrated, as you can see in this chart, in Asia, particularly in China and in India, and in Africa, the regions of the world, as we've just witnessed, where the populations are growing the fastest and where the middle classes are expanding. The scale of that growth comes into perhaps sharper focus when we look at the total consumption growth projected over the period, which will amount to 27% in developing and developed countries together but with a very significant broad range, with relatively very low growth uh, in single digits in developed markets like Europe and Japan, in contrast 
to the very high growth rates that is expected in Asia, again in China and India, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Latin America. Turning to the uh, production of milk around the world, what's the most striking aspect of this chart is India. It's the second bar from the top, just below Europe. This, these red bars represent current production levels of milk around the world. The blue bars represent the projected growth by 2023, the projected production by 2023. And as we can see, India is set over that period to overtake Europe by a considerable distance and become the world's largest milk producer, albeit much of it buffalo milk and most of it consumed in fresh form. What is particularly not notable about this is that the annual growth in production is set to fall to 2 .2, from 2.2% per year over the last 10 years to 1.9% over the next 10 years on average, with the FAO OECD citing limitations of land and water as the reasons in the Asian region, which together with the developing, other developing countries account for almost 80% of the projected growth in production over the next 10 years. This chart is from Tetra Pak. It shows on the right-hand side in orange and red the growth in the predicted milk deficit in the main import regions, which are principally Asia and Africa, and how they are balanced by the projected milk surplus growth in the main export regions in blue on the left-hand side, represented by Europe, the United States, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. And those four blocks uh, collectively account for almost 80% of the total exports of dairy products uh, exported around the world. With Europe leading on cheese, accounting for 39% of the world's exports by 2023, in, an, in a category whose import demand around the world is expected to grow by 2.4% per annum. New Zealand leads on whole milk powder and butter with uh, market shares of total exports of 57 and 47% respectively in categories which are expected to grow on an annual average basis of 1.7 and 0.7%. And finally, <coughs> skim milk powder per US is the leader, accounting for 34% of the world's exports by 2023 and an import demand expected to grow across the globe by 2.5% per annum. The destination of this global trade is more dispersed than its origins, but not surprisingly, with a particular focus on Asia and in Africa, with perhaps the exception of cheese, where there is a considerable import focus in the developed countries. But irrespective, it is China still that figures most prominently in virtually all developments across virtually all categories that we might consider, with this chart even demonstrating how even liquid milk imports appear to have taken off significantly in the Chinese market over recent years, travelling principally the long distance from Europe. The role and influence of China in the global marketplace is something I believe we all understand, and this is illustrated by the expectation of many that in the current environment that a short-term recovery will have to await uh, the resumption of import growth in the Chinese market predicted for later next year. It is, after all, the world's largest importer of dairy products. It has a self-sufficiency that has been under pressure in recent years of upwards of 80%, under pressure due to a production which is reliant on a lot of imported feed and rising import costs. It has a per capita consumption that is a mere third of the world average, so with huge upside potential, and that is the reason for the strong rising import demand that is predicted over the next 10 years by the OECD. The FAO OECD projections were prepared earlier this year when prices were still high. Albeit, they have correctly anticipated the subsequent decline which we have been experiencing in recent times. Yet, as we can see from this chart, they are nevertheless predicting that dairy product prices are set to remain high and well above historic levels over the forecast 10-year period. By any measure we might take, the medium-term prospects for dairy remain positive. And Ireland, with its international presence in, its international focus on the regions of the world where demand is set to grow the fastest, is well positioned to benefit. That, of course, doesn't mean that markets are not going to remain keenly competitive. Of course, they will. And it is a matter for each and every individual enterprise 
to search out and pursue every competitive edge it can leverage in the global marketplace. Yet it is true also that competition also takes place at country level. When we consider how we analyze markets using countries as a basis. And so with that in mind, earlier this year, and working on behalf of industry, we undertook uh, an evaluation among key customers in three target market regions to assess prior priorities, to assess uh, the perceptions around the positioning of Ireland in the Irish dairy industry, and the role of sustainability given the earlier launch of Origin Green and the Sustainable Dairy Assurance Scheme. Our evaluation included structured interviews with these 20 businesses in Europe, customers with centralised purchasing functions, sourcing a wide range of dairy ingredients with diverse uses across the full spectrum of the wider uh, food industry. Our evaluation extended to these and other businesses in, so in the contrasting Saudi market, a key target market in itself and also benchmark for the Middle East. And we interviewed... 10 leading infant formula manufacturers, global and local alike, in China, as well as five leading opinion farmers, including government institutions. A common thread running throughout our research in what are clearly diverse regions was the shared interest in security of supply, with some in Europe speaking of the need to move towards long-term agreements and onwards to China, where the search is there for acquisitions, for alliances, and for joint ventures. And of course, the growth potential now opening up in Ireland was not surprisingly of keen interest to customers in all regions. Similarly, our grass-based production systems and the implied cost competitiveness that goes with it is a major strength among our customers in the international marketplace. In the case of Europe, <coughs> where price and quality are not surprisingly continuing to be among the primary arbiters of choice, Markets and price volatility, the subject of the second session today, was cited frequently as a concern among buyers. Yet among all of the buyer priorities, it is the multidimensional nature of sustainability that offers the best potential for country differentiation and the opportunity to add value for our industry in the longer term. In Europe, 85% of the businesses interviewed cited their growing belief of the growing importance of sustainability in their business, with considerable variation, or considerable, some considerably more advanced in their thinking than others. In China, it was food safety, traceability and quality that are at the forefront of people's minds when they draw from the various dimensions that are sustainability. And we should not forget that these, in fact, are the dimensions that are at the core of the sustainability audit. Similarly, it should be evident that as the industry continues to build its presence in Asia and in Africa, that a deep understanding and insight into how our dairy products and ingredients are used by consumers <coughs> in what are very different cultural environments is critical if we are to add value to the industry's customers and to differentiate the Irish dairy offering. And so our consumer insights team has been working on behalf of in industry to help build these insights through what we call ethnographic consumer research, which involves our researchers visiting and staying in people's homes, living with them, shopping with them, eating them, studying their attitudes and behaviours around the use of dairy products in their homes. The faces you see on this image and the subsequent images that you will see are the faces of real people, real people and their families, participants in our research in South Korea, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and in Senegal. It is this kind of research that can give us the insights we need about customers in local markets in very different cultures that can enable our industry to add value to their customers and differentiate the Irish dairy offering. We have recently extended this research to the Chinese market, where this year, our researchers have spent over 300 hours in field, again visiting and staying with people in their homes in Beijing and Shanghai and Chengdu, conducting brand clinics, and exploring how Ireland can best position itself so that working with Irish suppliers, including global infant formula manufacturers with a presence in Ireland, 
and with the industry's Chinese partners to position itself so that working together we can build an awareness and preference for our dairy products among premium Chinese consumers. This is a world where reputation is everything. <coughs> and in a competitive dairy marketplace where countries compete with countries, reputation is critical. This final chart shows how 30 years ago, in the Standard & Poor 500 com companies quoted on the New York Stock Exchange, on the left-hand side of this chart, over 80% of the value of those 500 businesses was made up of physical, tangible assets. Today, if you look to the right-hand side, the red segment of the bar, 80% of the value of businesses now quoted in the Standard & Poor 500 is made up of intangibles, like reputation. And if reputation is so important to the valuation of businesses, so is it too with the industries of which they are part and the countries in which they are located. Origin Green shows what the Irish dairy industry, Irish dairy farmers and processors alike, collectively what they, it shows what they stand for. A program that is a world first without parallel anywhere, in the world, uh, anywhere else in the world. A program that underpins not just the reputation of our dairy industry, but also the reputation of the customers that our industry serves. And as our industry looks to the future, to searching out and, and realizing the new opportunities ahead of us, this is one opportunity that we can all leverage together. Thank you for your attention.